Are we ready for the Word of God this Sunday? Uh, I've been teaching out of the book of Genesis, uh, and this would be our, my fourth sermon, uh, fourth message out of this book. And uh, how many of you have been blessed by what's been taught so far? Yeah. Thank you, the three of you have, that have been blessed. You know, I hope more people will be blessed today, you know, and... Uh, and, uh, you know, I mentioned last week, uh, and I've been mentioning every Sunday before I start, uh, Genesis is the first book of the Bible, and it's about four events. The first half of the book is about four events. It's about uh, creation, the fall, the flood, and the Tower of Babel to which the nations of the earth came about. And after that, there's about four people. You've got Abraham, Isaac, uh, Jacob, and uh, Joseph. Uh, that's from there to the end of the book. So I'm, I've been preaching this, my fourth message, and I'm still uh, preaching out of the creation part of the book. And uh, it is really interesting that when you start to read this book, there's a lot of principles and a lot of uh, things that we can glean from the passages of the Scripture, from the passages of the Scripture, from what's being God is doing in the first book of the Bible, in the first part of humanity and um, a lot of things, a lot of principles are in place and we can see patterns and an order in the way God does things. So last week I shared uh, about how God created and there's an, there was an order in a creation and how the creation of the universe can be linked, the order that is used can be linked to the new creation, the creation of man. The same principles are at work. The same principles are in place. And I'm going to continue on that note and look at the order of the creation of man. There is an order in everything. And as long as there is an order that we follow, we work with God in that order, there will be no disorder in our lives. Amen? God is a God of order. Amen? And uh, it says that in creation, God spoke and things were created. He spoke, let there be, let there be, let there be, let there be. Everything was created by the spoken word of God. But when he came to the creation of man, he didn't speak. It says in Genesis chapter 2 verse 7, that the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Everything was created by the spoken word. But when it came to the creation of mankind, God formed it. it. The Bible implies a personal touch of God in the creation of mankind. So we literally have God's fingerprints on our lives. Amen? So God created the first man and the first woman. Uh, in fact, uh, today it is a common... Uh, it's, it, there's been a scientific discovery not too long ago where they studied the the DNA of uh, different uh, women uh, from different parts of the world, from, different, uh, from Asia, from Europe, from America, from Africa, from all the different continents, there was a study group and they took DNA samples from the placenta of the woman and, and, and they came to this conclusion that every, because of the study of the DNA, every human being on the earth share a common ancestor. In other words, all of us here have got the same great, 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 great to the power of God knows how many thousand, great, 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 great grandmother. We all had the same grandmother. And science accepts this as a scientific discovery and a scientific fact, and they are calling her mitochondrial Eve. She is the mitochondrial Eve, named after the mitochondrial DNA that they studied. And they basically said, we all came from this same woman that lived, they believe, 200,000 years ago. And here's another example of how science made a great discovery of what the Bible has been telling us for centuries. Amen? In fact, they even named her Eve. How apt, right? So God created the first man and the first woman. We all have the same great, 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 great grandma. How cool is that? We are all related. Not only the Malayalis are related. Everybody. (laughs) 
So uh, God created Adam, and there was an order in uh, the creation of man. It says, uh, it started off like this. Let us make man in our image and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over the cattle, over the earth, and over every creeping thing on the, on, on the earth. And then it says, so God created man in his image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So it started first like this. There was first a design and a purpose. Let us make man in our image, design, and let them have Dominion, purpose. There was a design and a purpose. After the design and the purpose, then there was the creation. So God created according to the design and the purpose that was first determined. Amen? Everything that is created, the chair that you sit on, the pulpit that I stand behind, everything first started off before this physical thing came about that we see with our eyes. It first started off with a design and a purpose. The inventor of the vacuum cleaner didn't just, just look at a couple of parts and say, I wonder what would happen if I joined this bag to this motor and put these wires together and put this hose here and let's, let's just put all these things together and let's just plug it in. And then we'll see what it does, and then we'll decide what to call it. And so he, he plugs it in, he plugs it in, and whoa, this invention sucks. Let's call it a vacuum. You see, it doesn't happen that way. There is always a design and a purpose. So the purpose and the design of mankind was decided before the creation of mankind. The purpose of man was to rule and reign on the earth, have dominion over all, to fulfill and subdue. And the design was, let us make man in our image, the image of God. And why? Because the image of God will give man what they need to fulfill the purpose that God had called them to fulfill. Amen? So your purpose, the point I want to make is this. Your purpose was decided before your creation. God had a plan and a purpose for your life, a purpose for you to fulfill. That's why you are here. If God didn't have a purpose for your life, He would not have created you. So, purpose and design came first, then creation. So, if there was no purpose and design, there would not have been creation, right? So, if you're here, it's only because that God has a purpose for your life. So your life has meaning. Your life has a God-given meaning and purpose. Amen? Your existence at this time is important or was important to God for this time and in this generation and in the place that He has placed you right now. You are meant to bring about the purposes of God in your world. Amen? I shared uh, last week this psalm, Psalm 139. You, were, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. I, shared, I asked you all to look at the person next to you. Why don't you do it again? Look at the person next to you and say, you're still wonderfully complex. <laughs> Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion. As I was woven together in the dark of the womb, you saw me, this is the part I want to get, you saw me before I was born, every day of my life was recorded in your book, every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. God already had your purpose and your days laid out even before a single one of them came into being. God already saw this day. God already saw you sitting in this church listening to this message, Amen. He laid out the days that are before you. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. We were created for what? So you were created for a purpose, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Your purpose was prepared beforehand. Before what? Before your creation. And then you were created to fulfill that purpose. So God prepared beforehand that you might walk in them, the good works that He's designed you to do on this earth, in this time. Amen? You have a God-ordained purpose for being here. And the most powerful thing that can happen to you and I 
to a person is the day we discover our purpose, why God has created us. And you know, you're not only given purpose, you were designed with the ability and the capacity to fulfill that purpose. God, there is design and purpose. That pretty much means that everything that God has designed you to do, that God wants to accomplish through your life, has already been put on the inside of you. You have what it takes. Look at the person next to you and say, you have what it takes. You know, people sometimes say, my life has no meaning. You may feel that way, but that's not the reality. God created your life with meaning and a purpose. He created your meaning. And it's only in Him that you will discover the meaning of your life. You will not find the meaning of your life outside of God. You will not find the meaning and the purpose for your life, for your existence outside of the Creator. Only in Him will you discover your purpose and your meaning. So God designed you. Let us make man in our image. So He created them. He gave you a purpose. Let them have dominion. And then it says in Genesis chapter 2.15, Then Lord took the man and put him or placed him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. There's a design. There's a purpose. There's your creation. And there is a place that God has prepared for you. Amen? You see, He didn't just create Adam and Eve and, you know, chuck them on the earth. Go, boys. Fine. Go, boy and girl. Find a nice spot, nice shady spot under a tree anywhere. Wherever you want to go, just go. Born free. (laughs) He had a place for them. He had a placement for their lives. There is a placement for your life. And he had a place for them. And that if God placed them somewhere, it's only because that place was going to be connected to their destiny. There is a place for your life. God placed you in that place, in that family, in that time, in that circumstances. You know, we didn't get to choose our family. We didn't get to choose our brothers and sisters. We didn't get to choose the time, the time in history that we wanted to get born into. And in the same way, uh, the first man didn't get to dictate to God where he wanted to be placed. But God placed him where God knew he was able to connect with his purpose and his destiny. God placed you where you are because from this place, you're going to connect with your purpose and your destiny. You know, I hear... I, I, I've heard people say things like, you know, I wish, I wish I wasn't born into that family, into that circumstances. You know, if I was born in a different time, in a wealthier family, under different circumstances, you know, if, if my mom was like this, if my dad was like this, if I had a mom, if I had a dad, you know, maybe my father and mother, uh, you know, if I had them, life would have been different, or if they were different, my life would have been different. You know, if God allowed you to be born in that place, in those circumstances, it's only because there are things that He has placed in that place, in those circumstances that are going to mold you, that are going to shape you, that are going to stretch you, that is going to connect you with the potential that you have, that He's placed on the inside of you, so that you can get connected to your purpose and fulfill your destiny. God is strategic as to where He places you. Amen? Amen. He placed Adam and Eve in a little garden in the east of Eden. Noah was placed in a time where the Bible says that there was none righteous, not even one. And that's a, that's a terrible time for a, for a God-loving person to be alive in. Nobody around him was getting in on it. But God placed him there for a purpose because through Noah, God was going to use him in that time among that people to bring the people of God out of one season into a new beginning. Amen? Amen. Joseph was born into a family where his brothers hated him. His brothers were envious of him. God allowed him to be born in that family because God knew the circumstances of that family was going to catapult him towards his purpose and fulfilling his destiny. He was placed in prison. 
you know, the place where he probably thought he was the furthest from God, furthest from the will of God, from the plans of God, from the purposes of God for his life. He's stuck in a dungeon somewhere, forgotten. But what he didn't know that God allowed him to be placed there where he thought he was furthest away from God's will and God's plan and purposes for his life. He was actually right there, nearest to where God wanted him to be. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. The children of Israel were placed in the wilderness so that their experience in the wilderness would turn them from a bunch of rowdy slaves into an elite army that's ready to take possession of the promised land that God had prepared for them. Esther was placed in a Persian uh, king's uh, uh, palace. And it was like a terrible place for a young Jewish girl to be, one of the king's concubines, one of the pagan king's uh, concubines, and you know, in that place, she would have thought she was f the furthest from the will of God and the plans of God and the purposes of God for her life. But God placed her there so that He could use her in that place to save an entire nation from genocide. Amen. The disciples were born in Galilee, a poor fishing, insignificant fishing village in the Middle East. I'm sure they would have wished, oh, if only we were born in Rome as an official, you know, we'd have a good life, a better life. But here we are, poor little fishermen. But God placed them there because it was in that place, in that circumstances that they were going to meet the Savior of the world. It was in those circumstances where God was going to turn them from fishermen into fishers of men. And today we are all beneficiaries because God strategically placed them in that place. Amen. Jesus Christ was placed at a cross. To his contemporaries, that's probably the worst possible way. You said you're the saviour of the world, you're the coming Messiah, but here you are, dead, crucified on a cross. But God placed him there so that today, all those who believe in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. God is strategic. <laughs> Paul was placed in prison. Paul never once complained about, you know, or the space that he was in, you know, why am I here, why am I doing this? But the thing, the great thing about Paul was no matter where he was, no matter where he was placed, no matter how bad it seemed, he found a way to glorify God in those circumstances. He always looked for the will and the purposes of God wherever he was placed in that moment and God worked mightily to that man. Amen. You know, I don't know where your life is at right now. You know, you may feel like, you know, some of you may feel like you're in the palace. Some of you may feel like you're in, in prison. Some of you may feel like you're in the, in the wilderness. But I, can, I don't know what, where you are right now in life, but I can assure you that God has allowed you to be in that place because there is a work that He wants to do in your life. And out of this place, out of this time, you're going to end up closer to fulfilling your purpose, closer to fulfilling your destiny than you were before you entered this place. Amen? He is a good God. Amen? You know, now is not the time to whine and complain. Now is the time to trust God in those circumstances, and look for His will. God, what, are you, what do you want to do? What are you trying to accomplish in and through my life in this place? Why am I here? What is your will? You know, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, He wasn't happy about where He was, or where He was going, and where He was placed. And we see that in His prayer. He says, Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. What was He saying? God, if I don't have to go through this, if, if you allow it, take this away from me. But he ends it like this. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. In those circumstances, he looked for the will of God to be done in and through his life. That was his prayer. Amen. I think some of us need to stop asking God for a way out, but switch to asking God, God, what is your will for me in this time, in this space that I'm in? What do you want to do in and through my life? Let your, not my will, but let your will be done. Amen? No matter where we find ourselves placed, learn to praise Him in prison, 
in the wilderness, wherever you are. Learn to bring glory to God wherever you are placed. Amen? You know, some of the most impactful ministries on the planet has been birthed because God placed people in some pretty tough, uncomfortable place, from Heidi, Heidi Baker in Africa to Bill Wilson in, in America to Mother Teresa in India. You know, they were in some uncomfortable places, and in those places, they didn't ask God or look for a way out. In those places, they looked for the will and the plans and the purposes of God to be established in and through their lives right where they are. Amen? And here's some news for us as Christians. You know, God isn't committed to you and I having a comfortable life. But He is committed to you and I having a fulfilled life. It's not the same thing. Amen? He's not committed to you fulfilling your ambition, but He is committed to you fulfilling your destiny. You have a destiny. Amen? You know, there were times in my life where I questioned God, why am I here? Why am I going through this? Why have I been placed in these circumstances? Why have you allowed me to go through this? But now when I look back, I realize everything that I've gone through in life, God has used to bring about certain things in my life to connect me with my destiny. Today I look back and I say, thank you God. Thank you God for working in my life that way. Amen? So God had a purpose and a design. He created men and He had a place for them. God placed Adam in the garden that He had prepared for them and the garden is where they start. But the garden is not where they were meant to remain and end up. You see, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, He says, The Lord God took, took the man, put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. That's where they started, where God placed them. But their original purpose on the earth was God blessed them. God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion. But here they were now in a garden, tending and keeping. But God said, be fruitful, multiply, have dominion, subdue. There was a great, great calling that was upon their life. But now they were tending and keeping. You see, the, the, the small garden where God placed them had a bigger picture attached to it, but the only way they were going to get into the bigger picture was through the small garden where God had placed them. Amen? There's a great responsibility on Adam's life. And, uh, and this is the point I want you to get out. Where you are now is necessary, may not be where you think God wants you to be, but where you are now is necessary for you to get to where God wants you to be. Amen? You can imagine, here's Adam, and he's in the garden, and he's like, tending. God, didn't you say to me, fill the earth, subdue it, dominate, what am I doing here? Cutting this flipping bungaraya tree in the garden. <laughs> where is that great calling? Why am I tending and keeping when I should be filling, subduing, dominating? But the filling, subduing, doing, dominating was in the tending and keeping. Amen? Uh, your beginning may not be reflective of your end destiny, but it is necessary. Amen? In Zechariah chapter 4, verse 8 onwards, it says, uh, verse 10, it says, Do not despise the small beginning. So do not despise the days of humble beginning. For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. Those of you who don't have the gift of tongues, just say his name about five times and you'll have it. <laughs> you see, Zerubbabel... Let's call him Zeru. Lah. Okay. So Zeru, <laughs> that's short, let's call him Z. So Z, <laughs> you see Z was called to rebuild the temple, but here he was walking around with a plumb line, taking little measurements and all that. And God says, do not despise the days of humble beginning because in the small things that he was doing now, that was going to lead him to the bigger things that was going to be accomplished for God. Amen. Uh, you see, David, David was anointed to be king over all of Israel. But he was in the desert after that, 
taking care of a couple of sheep for his dad. You know, he could have gone, you know, God, I've just been anointed, you know, I'm, I've been called to be, there's prophecies over my life, to be king, and all that. What am I doing here, taking care of this bunch of sheep in this desert, and no one even remembers me, and all that. but in that, God placed him there, and wherever God placed him, God was going to establish his purposes in and through those, those times, that place, amen? Joshua, uh, he, was, he was the one who led the entire children of Israel into the promised land. But for most of his life, he was Moses' servant. All he did was serve Moses. He was the guy who carried Moses' bag, who washed Moses' hands, who probably had to dig out stones out of Moses' toenails and feet when he came back from meeting God. But he was faithful where God has placed him. Amen? He did what God put in his hands for that moment. And from that place, God led him to his true destiny, to his true purpose. Amen? Amen. Luke chapter 16, verse 10, it says, He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. He who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you trust? Who will commit to your trust the true riches? And you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? I mean, uh, this particular portion of Scripture is talking about money, but it is also highlighting a principle that God works through. If you are faithful in little, God places the little in your hand. As you are faithful with that little, God will give much more. I'm a pastor today, but for much of my life, I spent doing things that didn't at all look like the prophecies that were given over my life as a young Christian. I've washed toilets, I've driven kids around uh, in the Sunday school, picked them up, dropped them off, did all kinds of things. Paperwork for a long time, compiling uh, reports, and didn't at all look like the call that God has placed upon my life. But that was where God placed me for that season, and I had to be faithful with what God put in my hands for that season. Amen? I remember when I was in Australia, uh, I... The moment we, uh, we arrive, after during our second class, uh, the pastor calls me out and he prophesies over me and he, he doesn't know anything about me. And he says, he gives this great prophecy about, you know, you're going to go back. I don't know where you're from, but this is what's going to happen. God's going to do this and stuff. And there's this great prophecy. And after that, I served a pastor by the name of Andrew Kabbalah. I was his chaperone. And my job was carrying his bags around. My job was driving him from meeting to meeting. And I remember, you know, in Australia, it's really expensive to go to a car wash. You wash, to take your car to a car wash, it would cost you like 80 Aussie. So it's really expensive. And I remember God putting in my heart to offer him to wash his car for him. So I was like, God, I I don't even wash my own car at home, right? (laughs) You know? to save this guy that money, you know, I thought it's ridiculous, $80. And I said, hey, Pastor Andrew, why don't you just let me wash your car for you? And he was like, of course, pleasantly surprised and very excited about it. And every week, I went to his house and I washed his car. And, you know, here's a guy who got this great prophecy about going back and doing this and doing that, and I was washing this pastor's car. But this is what God asked me to do for that season of my life. And today, if I look back, there were things that happened to me, there are encounters that I had during that time that are invaluable for my walk with God right now. Amen? God has got a plan for your life. And where you are right now may not, may not feel or may not look like where you're meant to be. You know, you're, you're, you're tending and you're keeping when, when you know you should be filling, subduing, dominating. It's like two different worlds. But as you are faithful with the tending and the keeping, God will lead you to the filling, the subduing, and the dominating. Amen? The filling, the subduing, the dominating is in the tending and the keeping. You know, Adam Adam did not see the filling, the subduing, and the dominating because he wasn't faithful with the tending and the keeping. He wasn't faithful with the tending and the keeping. You know, and, and that's how the devil works. You see, the devil comes to, to Adam and he, he does it like this. He always offers you a shortcut. 
he, he says to Adam, say, hey, you know, you, if you eat of this fruit, if you disobey, you know, you will be like God's. You know, it, it was God's will. It's not like, oh, Adam wanted to be like God and, you know, he was prideful. It was God's will for Adam and Eve to be like God's. He made them like God's on the earth. He gave them dominion, authority on the earth. Even in Psalms 82, he says, I have said you are God's. All of you are children of the Most High. God wanted him to be like God. But God has, has got a timing and a process to bring about his will and his purposes for your life. The devil will always come with a shortcut. He's offering them, he said, you can be like God's. You can, you can do what God ultimately wants you to do. Become what God ultimately become, wants you to do. But bypass the process, bypass the timing. A shortcut. And it's the same thing he did to Jesus. During the temptation of Jesus, Jesus was on the mountain and he comes to Jesus and he says, all these kingdoms has been handed over to him. Who handed it to him? Adam. All the kingdoms of the earth has been handed over to me. I will give it to you if you bow down and worship me. And he was offering Jesus the fulfillment of of what he taught was Jesus' call or Jesus' purpose on the earth. Jesus knew that he was meant to rule and reign on the earth. All authority will be given to him. Everything will be placed under his feet. The devil was offering him that end, but without the process at the wrong timing and through compromise. It seems like he was going to do the will of God. It seems like this is what God wants you to do, what? to rule and reign on the earth. So, here I'm offering it to you, love. without the suffering, without the cross, without the hard work, it's yours. But Jesus knew how to recognize the will of God, the timing of God, the purpose of God for His life. The processes were necessary, amen? And the devil always tries to give you a shortcut take the process out because he knows how important the process is. What God does in you is more important than what God does through you. Because if the work in you is not accomplished, he cannot do much through you. So the work in you is done through a process and God has a process for your life. Amen? Amen. So we not only need to recognize our calling, but very importantly, we need to recognize the seasons of our lives. We go through seasons in our lives. You need to recognize the season that you are in with God right now. It may be a season to be still and just know Him. It may be a season to just endure. Jesus, for the glory set before Him, endured. Just endure. It may be a season to just study, spend time with God. What is God doing in your life? Yes, there's a great prophecy. Yes, there are things that God wants to accomplish, but recognize the season because the timing is so, so important. I remember Pastor Phil Pringle sharing with us how he knew he was called to go to Australia and he was a Kiwi. And... Uh, he heard the call and he immediately packed his bags and he left and he went to Australia. He recognized the call. He knew the call of God upon his life. He left to Australia, but nothing seemed to work out. And he ended up, after some time, going back to New Zealand. Then he realized it was the right calling, but not the right timing. There was something else that God wanted to do in his life. And he stayed in New Zealand. And, and finally, when he knew in his heart, okay, now is the time, he went with God. And then the ministry flourished where God sent him. Amen? We need to recognize our calling, but also understand the seasons that we are in with God right now. You may be going through different seasons in God. Don't be disappointed. Wherever you are, you know, God has placed you for a season because there is a work that
that He wants to accomplish in and through your life. That place you're in has the right ingredients to bring about the image of God, the will of God, the purposes of God in your life. It is necessary. Amen? It is necessary for the success of your ministry that you might fulfill the purposes of God for your life. Amen? Come on, let's stand. You know, and just because it was Valentine's Day yesterday, I'm going to throw in this additional, additional uh, point that I got from the scripture. About the processes of God. You see, God had a purpose. He had a design. He had a place. And He had a responsibility for Adam in that place. Amen? So He placed him in the Garden of Eden. And uh, Adam needed to be established Adam knew his purpose. Adam knew his God. He walked and talked with God. He knew his purpose. He knew his place. He knew his capacity. And and he knew his responsibility in that place, stand and keep. Only after all of that was established in Adam's life, did God bring a partner into Adam's life. How many of you know where I'm going with this? You see, they, so there, 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 is a, there is a process, amen? There is an order that brings order into your life. So today there are a lot of people who want to jump steps in the order. They don't know their, their purpose in life. They don't know their relationship with God. They don't know their place in life and they do not know their responsibility in the place that they don't know in the first place. But they want to jump all that and they want God to bring me that partner. And that's why I see many relationships in disorder because these things have not yet been established. God, you know, Adam didn't bug God for a partner. He didn't say, God, I want a partner, I want a partner, I want a partner, I want a partner. (laughs) God knew when Adam was ready. Amen? And then God brought the partner into Adam's life. Listen, God knows, maybe you've been praying for a partner. I'm going to say this, Lord, people are not going to like me after this, but it's okay. Maybe you're, you're praying for a life partner. Maybe you're not yet ready for that partner, for that, for that place, for that that. You're not yet ready for that stage of your life because there are things that need to be established. God loves you too much to allow you to ruin your life by just jumping, giving you what you want every time you pray and ask for something. If if He knows it's going to destroy your life and going to destroy your future, trust Him. Know your purpose. Know your God. Know your place. Know your responsibility. And then God will know the right person to bring into your life at the right time. Amen? God knew when Adam was ready and I'm sure God will know when you are ready. Amen? Happy Valentine's Day. (laughs) So much in the book of Genesis, right? Amen. (laughs) Amen. Amen. Come on, let's pray. Listen, a partner is not supposed to give you your purpose in life. Your purpose and your identity is from God. Don't look for someone else to be what God should be in your life. Amen? Let God be God. When you're secure in your relationship with God, when you know your purpose, when you know your place, when you're, then you will be, your relationship will be great. Because you're not draining and sucking the other person dry emotionally and mentally. Amen? Hallelujah. Come on, let's just lift our hands to God. You know, I believe different parts of this message spoke to different people. And I don't know what spoke to you, but I pray right now that the Holy Spirit will respond to that word in your life. 
even as your heart is open right now, in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit, yes, Lord, do what only you can do in each and every heart, in each and every life right now, O Lord. Father, let your kingdom come. Let your work be established, Lord. Let not a single person here end their life without fulfilling their God-ordained purpose and destiny, without fulfilling the destiny that you created them for without being who you designed them to be, O oh Lord. Everything that the enemy has stolen, Lord, we, we command that it be returned in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. According to your word, Lord. According to your word, Lord. Father, if their, their destiny has been robbed of them, Father, it is never too late to get into the presence of God. Just, be, just as the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, Lord, let your word come to them again, O oh Lord that they will walk in fruitfulness, O oh Lord, for the kingdom of God. Lord, I bless your people, O oh God. I bless your people, Lord. Touch their hearts, even right now, O oh Lord. Father, raise up a mighty army, a mighty army, O oh Lord, on fire for you, Lord. A mighty army that knows their God and does great exploits for the kingdom, O oh Lord. Lord, I pray for your protection over every person here, Lord. Your protection, every work of the enemy, Lord, will not succeed against him, even as your word says. No weapon formed against will prosper. Lord, no weapon formed against your people will prosper, O oh God. They are your people that your angels will guard and protect them, O oh Lord. Father, we thank you for the work that you have already begun, O oh Lord, Father. And Father, I thank you for the great work that is ahead, Lord. Father, we claim this nation right now in the name of Jesus, a Malaysia for Jesus, O oh Lord. We declare, we believe, O oh Lord. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done. Hallelujah. In this nation, through our lives, O oh Lord, Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give a clap offering to Jesus.